Friday of school in and around the downtown area. I go towards Chester DA every day. It was kind of a change. And I must echo this young lady's sentiments about welcoming uh, outsiders because my wife went to uh, Chichester High School and she feels most comfortable around all these people. Again, thank you. Don't be shy, Jakey. <laughs> no history? Jean? Jeannie, I know you have some history. <laughs> no, I just, for most of you know, and I just thank all of you that um, sent me well wishes over the last year and a half, two years of lots of medical challenges and something kept sticking in my head that my dad used to say, and some of you had him as a school principal at Mass Ward when you were really little kid, um, when people would talk about getting older, and he would always say, probably uh, echoing his Amish raised mother, um, beats the alternative. And I've thought about that a lot, you know. Uh, I feel so fortunate to be alive and to be involved in things, and I know I'm about to get hearing aids because the chemo that I had apparently trashed my hearing. And I think that what we all need to really pay attention to is it's a blessing, it is a gift to be able to get older. And when you read the list of the people that are not here, they would have given anything to be here. And so through the trials, through all that stuff that we're going through, and you know, I've lived around my whole life, it's like, so what? You know, we are here, we're all still doing good things and connecting with people, and that's what really counts. Thanks. Okay, who would like to be next? How about Mr. Wilkerson or Mr. Henderson? <laughs> well, this is my second time here for the reunion. Uh, I told you the last time, so it's the same story. <laughs> uh, I was a chef. I worked all over the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, I traveled a lot most of the time. I'm back here now. I'm living in Coatesville. I'm still single and I'm not looking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so good to see all you guys, you know. Uh, I see Glenny all the time. I run into Jack every now and then. Uh, anybody, I see Susu in passing. Uh, but uh, everybody else endured. I haven't seen him since he graduated. <laughs> that was my roadie. <laughs> but it's good to see everybody and see most of us are in good health. So God is good. Were you in Mr. Kramer's business class? Yeah. I think I was in that class with you. You probably well, I remember you very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. No, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. But uh, it's good to see everybody, and I hope we're all here for the next one. Oh, yes. Thank you. This feels good to be here. Thank you very much. So glad to have you. <laughs> we need somebody. Okay. Come on, Patsy. I never Sue. knew you to be shy. Patsy Sue, you came no. late. Tell us. Yeah, you, you have it. You tell us why.
through our life. So I'm very glad to see all of you, and I wish you well. And as I don't know, I think it was Mr. Wilkerson said, I hope I see you next time around. Uh, next month, the second Tuesday. Second Tuesday at Uno's. At Uno's at one o'clock. One o'clock. One o'clock. Right. Thank you. Alfonso. Pardon? Alfonso. 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 Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. I always pick on the shop. No. Okay. I'm going to tell a story on Alfonso. He won't talk. <laughs> the 35th reunion was at the Italian Social Club in Westchester, and we had a blast. But Alfonso came with Cookie and Wes, and he was afraid that they would want to stay later than he, because he wanted to get home early. And Cookie swears at 12 o'clock they had to drag him out the door. <laughs> <laughs> is two great-grandchildren this year. All right. Very good. Great. That's it. Nothing else has changed. Wow. Jane? Um, everything's the same. Uh, although I'm going to have a new grandchild. The 11th of October, hopefully. So that'll be fun. Is that your first? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm a, a great grandmother. Yeah, how many? Uh, just like to add something about Al that I found out as I we were coming here today. He had triple bypass surgery. In oh. oh. And he's doing very well. He's walking again. Uh, and we're glad that he is able to do that. Um, my life hasn't changed an awful lot. Unfortunately, Wes isn't with me today because his. 60th party is today at the Whitman Country Club at the same time. So that's where he is, the guest reunion, and I'm here with mine. Thank you, Cookie. Well, I, have so <clears throat> I have something to tell. How about Nancy and Dora? We missed but, them last time. Yeah, but someone has to videotape this. Who's, who's, you, you videotape it. Just, just hold it. Okay. Just hold it. All right. Uh, after 49 years with my uh, partner, I got married last year. Hey! And we celebrated 50 years in July. I didn't think I'd ever live to see it. <laughs> and I still can't get him to come here. He drives me up. So oh. you'll see him. He'll pick me up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Glad I was able to come today and see all you wonderful people. I'm so glad to see everybody so healthy and, and happy. And uh, hey, we could go on for another 20, 30 years. Good luck with that. I'll need more glue. <laughs> Lots of glue. Well, I, don't, I never gave a report at any one that we can do. Well, I missed you last time. Well, I don't think we've ever done. We forgot anyway if you did. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Everything going well in Western Tennessee. In fact, the, the first thing in the morning when I get up, I look out the window just to make sure I'm on the green side of the grass. And so far, it's been that way, so it's good. So that's keeping me going. But uh, I flew for about 30 years in various different jobs in, uh, in Europe and in, in, uh, Africa and South America. And probably the, the most exciting uh, flight that I had was, uh, was that 59? I was uh, 90, 90, 90, 1990, in uh, April, I think it was. 
Uh, had a flight down to Haiti, uh, working with the Mission Aviation Fellowship, making international flights. And uh, they just finished the coup down there, and when I got down there, dropped off the load of cargo, picked up seven people that were anxious to get out of Haiti because they'd been there during this five-day coup, and one girl was uh, hunkered down in a house while they were firing uh, tank shells back and forth over her house. So she was kind of wanting to get out of it. She went down to do a short-term mission project. So we were all loaded up and ready to go, and uh, two got the coup was over. Two guys that were on the losing side were trying to get out of the country, so they decided to hop a ride with us. So they hijacked us there uh, out of the cafe in Haiti. And uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure where they wanted to go, but I was afraid they wanted to go to, to Colombia, which I had no charts and didn't even know how far it was and didn't even know if I had enough gas to get that far. And uh, the other destination I thought they wanted to go to was to Cuba. And of course, if you go to Cuba, you get to stay for a week or two. <laughs> so I didn't want to go there. But anyway, when the one guy, they spoke broken English, she told me they wanted to go to Miami. They wanted to go to Miami. I go, what are you going to do in Miami? And I want to see President Bush. <laughs> I said, well, what do you want to see him for? He says, well, President Bush, I want to tell him how bad things are in Haiti. We need help. I said, well, look, I'll guarantee you if I take you to Miami that I can hook you up with one of the representatives of President Bush. <laughs> and uh, he thought that was a good deal. So we took off and flew up to Miami. And of course, on the way up, uh, on, on my transponder, if you know what that is, just an electronic signal that goes out from the airplane to the flight controllers. I put the hijacking code in there so that they would know. Of course, before I left the ground, most of the people down there had Cap Asian had called back to, to Miami to our headquarters and told them that the airplane had been hijacked. Yeah. So anyway, uh, they knew that. So when I called into the uh, controller, because I've been flying down there for about five years, called into the controller, and it was one of the girls that was on, I don't know what her name was or anything, but you talk to her every day so you kind of feel like you know her. And uh, I just gave her my call sign and and told her I was looking for a clearance. And she says, okay, well, where do you want clearance to? I said, Miami. And she said, okay, you're clear to Miami. That's not the way it goes. Usually when you call in and uh, <clears throat> they come back and they uh, ask you for the clearance and then you read this real long clearance of all the places you're supposed to go and report and all this kind of stuff. And uh, finally I said to her, I said, are you reading my transponder code? Because she didn't say anything about being hijacked. She said, yes, got your transponder to go. But see, my adrenaline was running pretty good by, by this time. Because <laughs> we had to break several laws to get out of Haiti. Uh, one of them was that uh, we, we had to have a seat for every passenger. Well, we were two seats short. And uh, the one guy, we had a little drink holder in there. The one hijacker sitting on that, and the other one sitting on his floor. And of course, they both had weapons. We don't, we don't haul weapons. And the airplane was overweight for takeoff, but we took off anyway, didn't have much choice. They decided they wanted to go. And before we took off out at the end of the runway, uh, the back door was still open. The airplane won't fly with the back door open. And I have a little door uh, right on the pilot's seat that I could crawl out there. So I told the one hijacker, I said, look, I gotta go back and close that door back there and we can't go. And he's, uh, he'd given me his pistol while we were taxiing out to the end of the runway, I had a 357 uh, revolver, so I got that. So I thought I was doing pretty good getting that. If I get the other guy to leave his AK-47 there, it'd be okay. <laughs> and uh, I told him I had to go back and close that door, and, and then he reached down in his little bag and pulls up this cylinder about that long, about that big and round, olive green, and he says, I have a bomb. He says, if you don't, if you don't come back, I blow the airplane up. I said, okay, I'll be back. <laughs> and the guy in the back, I told him that uh, he had to leave his gun because in Miami they don't like guns. That's the only time I lied to these guys. <clears throat> so he, he uh, wouldn't leave his gun, so I had to leave it. So he closed the door up the wall. And uh, by the time I talked to the controller, he was kind of getting a little excited. So I, I told her, I was 
wondering why she didn't say anything at me being hijacked. Then I realized, well, she's not going to say that because, you know, you do it on the transponder so that the hijackers don't know that you've recorded them. So they can, they think that they're still clandestine. So anyway, uh, when we were flying up from Hades, three and a half hour flight, very poor news day in the United States. All the news stations covered our flight. On all the major stations that night, we had the, the flight on there. And my pastor had been over in uh, Kenya, wasn't it? He was over in Kenya on a trip over there, and I got an email from him the next day, and he showed me uh, in his email where he read it in the Herald Tribune, which is an international paper. Had it on the front page of that about the hijacking and all that. So we made a lot of news. But uh, it, was, it was interesting. We had a Coast Guard jet flying uh, behind us coming up from Haiti all the way. Didn't know it at the time. Didn't know it until it was landing. And uh, of course, we're in a twin engine uh, Cessna, the one about 180 knots. And 180 knots is almost landing speed for this jet. So he's back there with all his flaps down, the gear down and everything, throttled back at a high altitude going on, trying to stay behind us. And when I, so I told the controller when I got the hold of one up in the United States that I thought the best thing would happen, I didn't know what they were going to do when we got there. So the best thing is just if you have one person in a suit meet us at the airport, I think we can get out and get these guys out and we can get separated from them and you can do what you want to do. And uh, <clears throat> he said, he didn't say anything. They never agreed or anything. So anyway, we got up to Miami and we landed. And we got into the airport. And uh, they, they told me to, when I land, go to the bomb building. Uh, the bomb building? I've never heard of this. <laughs> so I wanted to be a very professional pilot. So I had my Jeffs out with a three-page fold-out of the airport diagram. And I'm looking, and I couldn't find it. And uh, so I called him back. We're getting really close. We're getting ready to land. And he didn't even tell me what runway to land on. There's three runways there. And of course, there's 747s coming and going all over the place. So um, when I got in there a little closer, I, I finally called the controller. I said, uh, no, he didn't even tell me what runway. Said, what runway you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, these runways are between seven and 9,000 feet. And I need like 1,000 feet. So I, I said, yeah. Just the shortest, I knew the shortest one was nine right, so I said, well, we'll take nine right. So okay, you're clear, clear to land on nine right. So then I called back again, because I, when he, about this bomb building thing, I said, you know, I said, sir, I've looked all over my chart, and I can't find anything where there's a bomb building. And he keyed his mic to answer me, and I could hear the whole center. This is my inside here. All the guys in there just cracking up. Because <laughs> it's not something they publish, you know, they don't tell you where it is. He said, there'll be a truck there to meet you. You just follow this truck in to where they tell you to go. So they followed us in, and uh, oh, we followed him in, and then he took us around the circle. We're out in the middle of the airport, right by the fire station. Terminal buildings and everything's all gone, and uh, way far away. So, And this guy out there in this suit, and he had a radio, he could talk to me. And he's telling me, go around the circle, come right here, around. And finally, about the third time around, I'm thinking, you know, you idiot, you know, we want to get out of this airplane, just let me park this thing and get out. So anyway, he finally got us where he wanted us, so we, we got out and got separated from them. from them. So when I left the airplane, I got the seven passengers out. He said, go around, tell them to go around by, the, by that building. There's a big metal building there. Four little ventilation slots down on the ground. So we went around that building. I took the pistol with me, and I took off, that was in the uniform. Took off around the building, and as soon as I went around the building, there was an FBI guy standing, obviously FBI, because nobody else wears a three-piece suit in Miami <laughs> at 95 degrees. So I, I handed him the pistol, and I went around the corner, and it was unloaded. I, the guy had unloaded it before he gave it to me. And uh, by the time I got around the building, next thing I know, I'm about, that far off the ground with my nose pressed up against the wall of this building and two huge guys in, in uh, SWAT team outfits, helmets and all that stuff, hold me there and one guy said, where's the gun, where's the gun, where's the gun? I said, I gave the guy around the corner. He said, I'm the pilot. And then he says, can you prove it? <laughs> <laughs> I, go, uh, 
I'd take it for pride if I get back to the airplane. <laughs> but uh, no, I didn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> so I told him, uh, yeah, I can, uh, I got my license in my pocket. He said, let me see. So I got my license out. So they took me in the building then, and all the passengers, two, three of them, two of them women, I think. And they're, no, three of them, because there's a Haitian count there. They're all lined up against the wall like I was, nose up there, handcuffed and everything, and two guys on each one of them. And I looked in the middle, there's this great big van parked there, a big truck. I looked in that thing, and they had, it was like a, it was like an arsenal in there. They had guns all over, there, racks and everything. And I looked over by the, the wall where the uh, ventilation slots were, and they had, on, they had Browning automatic rifles on the tripods with a box of ammunition there and a belt going through, and there's four guys, you know, they're lined up on the airplane out there. Wow. So I thought, well, that's what he was trying to position us for. So anyway, we all, we all survived it. We got in, I had to go through an hour and a half debriefing with the head FBI guy and the head FAA guy, and they were happy after it was all over, told them the story and everything. So then the, the guy says, well, <clears throat> he says, just for curiosity, would you like to have a little information on what happened here today? And I said, well, what was that? He said, well, when we got the call about this hijacking, he said, we had just practiced a similar hijacking, a, a routine practice up in Palm Beach, that's about 90 miles away, two weeks ago. And uh, everybody was up there, and we did this whole thing, whole scenario, just like you had here today. And he said, do uh, you know how many people were supporting you here? And I thought, I had no idea. He said, it was 250. They had a special firefighting team, bomb squad, FBI, Dade County Sheriff's Department, the, the um, Miami Police Department, a special SWAT team, a whole bunch of them there. It all, you know, read off to me that they had their so That was probably the most exciting flight that I had. <laughs> and, uh, well, I didn't yeah. see you have anything more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people say, well, you know, Boy, you got hijacked. That was really something. How'd it work out? I said, I was killed. 